1677, William Hubbard published a book in Massachusetts. It contained this map. It's thought to be the first map of New England that was published or printed in America. Uh, now, once you get over the, strong, uh, the strange orientation of the map with east facing down and west facing up, you notice that two terrain features really stand out. They're both rivers, the Connecticut River and the Merrimack River. And that's really not surprising because from the time of their founding, the English colonies in North America were largely dependent for their survival on trading goods from the interior, such as fur and timber, with England and other locations overseas. Because rivers were the highways of 17th century America, they were the only wet way to get these goods from the interior forests to the coastal ports for shipment overseas. Now, the Merrimack River had a flaw as a transportation means. And that was the Pawtucket Falls. Originating in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, the Merrimack flows southward until it crosses today's New Hampshire-Massachusetts border. And then it curves 90 degrees to the east, and it flows out to the Atlantic Ocean. Just a short distance after it makes that curve, the Merrimack drops 32 feet in elevation in less than a mile, starting at the Pawtucket Falls. It was a significant obstacle to navigation, but because there was no alternative, uh, people back then made it work. The boats and barges carrying timber and other materials would come downriver. Just before the falls, they'd pull ashore. All of the cargo would be carried off the boats, and it would either be carried or dragged on land, past the falls, and it would be loaded onto other boats to continue its journey to Newburyport and the ocean. It was inefficient, but there was really no alternative. And then in the years right after the American Revolution, Americans became very interested in what they called internal improvements. It's what we would call transportation infrastructure projects, both public and private. And it was in that spirit that a group of merchants from Newburyport partnered with some landowners near the Pawtucket Canal to ask the state legislature to grant them a corporate charter to create a company that would construct such canals and locks as were necessary to overcome obstacles to navigation on the Merrimack River. And so in 1792, the Massachusetts state legislature granted a corporate charter to the proprietors of the locks and canals on Merrimack River. These men quickly got to work, and after four years and $50,000 of expenditures, they opened the Pawtucket Canal. The Pawtucket Canal left the Merrimack only about 100 yards upstream from the falls, and then it swung in a wide arc to the south of the, of the river, uh, until it joined not the Merrimack, but the Concord River, a short distance from where that river flowed into the Merrimack. The Pawtucket Canal covered a distance of a mile and a half, and it used four lock chambers to accommodate the difference in elevation of the upper Merrimack and the lower Merrimack. It was a great success because boats didn't have to unload and cargo didn't have to be carried overland. It could all stay on board and it was a much more efficient way of shipping it out to Newburyport. But the state legislature had only granted these guys a corporate charter. They hadn't granted them a monopoly. And so a competing group from Woburn also petitioned the legislature to allow them to form a company. The legislature granted that request, and so was formed the proprietors of the Middlesex Canal. These gentlemen uh, were more ambitious. And so they dug a canal that was 27 miles in length, left the Merrimack River about a mile above the falls, and then it sliced southeasterly through Middlesex County until it joined the Charles River and Boston Harbor. It was much more lucrative to ship your goods from the interior of New England to Boston Harbor than it was to ship them to Newburyport 
So the Middlesex Canal almost immediately captured all of the transportation business. The Pawtucket Canal quickly fell into disuse and its owners basically abandoned it. Over time, its lock chambers and the walls of the canals deteriorated. And it stayed that way until a snowy day of November of 1821, when these three guys came to visit the Pawtucket Falls and the Pawtucket Canal. There were Kirk Boot, Nathan Appleton, and Patrick Tracy Jackson. They were disciples of a man named Francis Cabot Lowell who en envisioned a great industrial city. Francis Cabot Lowell was born in Newburyport during the same week that the British marched out to Lexington and Concord and the American Revolutionary War began. His father was a very prominent lawyer, but at a, a young age, Francis set himself up as a merchant trader in Boston, and he made a fortune importing goods from the Orient. He was always in pretty precarious health, however, and so in 1810, he and his young family traveled to England for an extended vacation. Now, in England, Francis became fascinated by the emerging textile industry in that country. He spent days in mills, looking at the operations, looking at the machinery, understanding how it worked. He was very impressed, but he imagined that he could do better. And so in 1812, when Francis Cabot Lowell came back to America, he put together a team of mechanics, managers, and investors who joined together to build America's first standalone cotton manufacturing plant on the banks of the Charles River in Waltham. Now, what was unique about this facility was that raw cotton would come in one end and finished cloth would come out the other. It was a huge success almost immediately. There was an insatiable demand for domestically produced textiles, cotton cloth. Investors received a 25% return in the first year. Everyone clamored for expansion. The problem was the Charles River only fell six feet, and so it didn't produce enough hydro energy to power any additional mills. They needed a new location. Before they could find one, Francis Cabot Lowell died at age 42 of consumption. That was in 1817. His idea didn't die with him, however, and his friends carried it forward. And that's what brought them to the banks of the Merrimack River in 1821. They liked what they saw. They quietly bought all the stock of the proprietors of the Locks and Canals Corporation. That gave them ownership of the Pawtucket Canal, and more importantly, control over all of the water that flowed through it. They also purchased the sparsely settled farm and pasture land of East Chempsford on both banks of the canal and on the south banks of the Merrimack River. They worked quickly. In 1823, the Merrimack Manufacturing Company produced its first cotton cloth on the banks of the Pawtucket Canal. Other mills were built rapidly. The city expanded. It filled up with mill workers, laborers to build new mills. The factory owners soon decided that the rural government of Chelmsford was insufficient for the needs of such a big factory enterprise. And so these men petitioned the Massachusetts legislature to grant them a charter for a new town. The legislature granted that request in 1826 and these men named their new town Lowell in honor of their departed mentor, Francis Cabot Lowell. Less than 10 years after Lowell was incorporated, President Andrew Jackson came to lead a parade of VIPs and dignitaries that came to the community. Jackson spent two days here looking in great detail at what was going on in these mills. When he left, he said, not only have I never seen anything like it in my life, I never have imagined anything like it in my entire life. President Jackson was followed by dignitaries such as Davy Crockett, Henry Clay, Charles Dickens, and a young congressman from Illinois named Abraham Lincoln. Lowell continued to grow rapidly. 
By the eve of the Civil War, it had 58 textile mills employing 15,000 workers. Every week, they turned 800,000 pounds of cotton into 2.4 million yards of cloth. And it all started with a failed venture, the Pawtucket Canal, which couldn't make it as a transportation canal. Now, through Lowell's 190 years of existence, the city has had a lot of ups and downs. But one thing that's been a constant is the ability to take a project that didn't work out the way that was intended and repurpose it for another use. We're surrounded by recent examples of that. In the early 1990s, changes in the computer industry called caused Lowell-based weighing labs to falter. The company was the largest employer in the city and its corporate headquarters, the three weighing towers out on Industrial Ave, dominated that part of the city. In 1994, weighing's difficulties caused its lenders to foreclose on these towers. Three buildings that cost $60 million to construct less than a decade earlier sold at a foreclosure auction for $525,000. The new owners were very aggressive and with the use of very innovative uh, city planning funds, they landed 9X as an anchor tenant, renamed the buildings Cross Point. The buildings quickly filled up and they've been thriving ever since. Wang had built this five-sided, six-story building right alongside the Pawtucket Canal here in downtown Lowell as its worldwide training center. Customers from all over the globe were to come to Lowell to learn how to use Wang's software and hardware. The computer maker's bankruptcy caused that facility to close and it stayed vacant for several years until imaginative leaders at Middlesex Community College acquired the building and turned it into the centerpiece of the college's city campus. Just across the Pawtucket Canal from the Wang Training Center was a Hilton Hotel, 252 rooms built there on the promise of full occupancy of Wang's students. Wang's demise sentenced the hotel to two decades of high vacancy and plenty of red ink. And it wasn't until 2009 that the relatively new chancellor of UMass Lowell, Marty Meehan, acquired the building, called it, renamed it the UMass Lowell Inn and Conference Center, and filled it up with students, conferences, and used both to enliven the downtown. This very building we're in, an old uh, 19th century church that was vacant for decades, was taken over by UTEC, the United Teen Equality Center. They now use it as their headquarters, and it's one of the most environmentally friendly buildings in Massachusetts. So the lesson of Lowell is this. Just because a venture fails doesn't mean it's a failure. It just means it's an opportunity to try something else. And that's true whether you're in business, it's true whether you're in government, and it's true in the lives of the individual. And that's the lesson of Lowell. Thank you very much. <laughs>